I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to the last portion of Matthew chapter 7, and we'll be uh, finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. We have enjoyed being in that for uh, the last year, and so we'll get a chance today to kind of see where Jesus wraps things up. Wraps things up. He gave them four warnings in this text. Last week we looked at the first warning. Uh, this week we want to look at the rest of them. But he's talking about being saved. The need to reach a decision in your life where you trust Christ and, and you know that you have trusted him and you are saved and you're on your way to heaven. Now, after we gave the sermon last week, one of our 91-year-old ladies uh, trusted Christ as their Savior and Lord. And her, and her family is, yeah, praise the Lord. Her family was so excited because it's not, it's not an age thing here. But, you know, she said, you know, I've, ne- I've never done that, you know. And, and so now her family, if something happens in her life, she, they have the joy of knowing that as well. In addition to that, on Monday, one of, uh, one of our younger kids, um, Grace, uh, trusted the Lord on Monday. Uh, Grace Rogers. Uh, she's, I don't know, how old do you think she is? Is she five or six? Five? So she said, you know, I need, she needed to make that decision. And that came really as a result of both the Sunday morning and last Sunday night, Jason was speaking on, on the grace of God, amazing grace from the, the book of Titus. And so this little gal really paid close attention because he's talking about her, you know, grace, you know. And so she paid more attention. And on Monday, she wanted to talk about that and, and about the fact that she needed the Lord. Now, there are probably others as well, but it's just encouraging that the Lord speaks to hearts. And I hope that if, as you're here today, if you don't know for certain that you've trusted the Lord, if you can't um, confess Jesus as Lord, then that today would be that day for you. Last week when we looked at it, we said, you know, there, the emphasis from the world's point of view is, oh, there are many roads. There are many roads. They all go to the same place. And that's not really true. But last week, we said Jesus was sharing. He was preaching this sermon. And he was preaching to the disciples and to the crowd and to the religious leaders. Mainly, though, he was teaching the disciples. And his eye was on the crowd. And his eye was on the religious leaders. And he even said at one point in chapter 5, verse 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not going to get to heaven. And they go, wow, who can get to heaven then? And that's where he really appreciates, that's where he wants them to be. Who can get to heaven? Well, let me tell you, I can tell you how to get to heaven, is what he says to them. Some people believe all roads lead to heaven, and that's not the case. You can listen to different speakers, self-help people uh, in our society, and they'll all be saying kind of that same thing, pretty much. Nobody has the only way. If you listen to uh, one of the... One of the clips uh, from the Oprah show um, is on YouTube, and she's talking about how, oh, there are many roads, you know, and there's no one way to heaven. And and one woman actually said, no, that's not right. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so Oprah's kind of arguing with her. Of course, Oprah had the microphone at that point, but you could hear what the other woman was saying in the process. Because they want you to know, they want you to think all roads lead to heaven. So Jesus is really saying, which road are you on? And he gave them the choice of two roads. One road is broad, and it leads to destruction. And he said, one road is narrow, and it leads to life. One is right, one is wrong. And he says, which which road are you on? We discovered last week that there's a, a gate. There are two gates. One gate is broad, and it leads to the broad way. And one is narrow, and it leads to the narrow way. And last week, we learned that Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he will be saved. So people get upset and they say, well, why do you think Christianity is so exclusive? Why is it the only way? Why can't you be a Buddhist or Confucius or why can't you be Islamic? You know, all of us want the same thing. No, we don't all want the same thing. We may all want God. But God revealed himself in the person of Jesus. And it was Jesus who said, 
I am the way, the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So it's not any other way to heaven. And so Jesus is this door. And when you go through this door to Jesus, he said it's going to be straight and it's going to be narrow. And sometimes you tell your kids, no, just keep on the straight and narrow. And the Lord says, you know, that's the way it is when it comes to being saved. We said there are two gates. One's broad, one's narrow. That leads to two roads. One is broad and one is difficult, the scripture says, and that leads to two destinations. One is destruction, one is life, eternal life. So last week when we looked at this, we started at Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, and it says this, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. So the idea is, where do the majority of people go? The many go. They go through this broad gate. He goes on in verse 14 and says it this way. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life. And how many find it? Just a few find it. So here's what we said last week. More people will go to hell than to heaven. And that means in a, in a city like ours, with thousands of people living here, more people will go to hell than to heaven. Our task is to, to go and to make disciples and let them know. We want to make it, we want to say, that Lancaster and Palmdale and the surrounding area, let's make it a difficult place from which a person would go to hell. Let's make it difficult for them to go to hell. Let's tell them how to go to heaven. But Jesus comes along and he warns us about this in the Sermon on the Mount. He gives us four warnings. And last week we looked at the first one. And the first warning was this, don't go the wrong way. There's a, there's a right way, there's a wrong way, there's a narrow way, there's a broad way. Don't go the wrong way or you'll spend eternity in hell. And eternity is a long time. Last week, we, I, gave you this, I gave one of the services this illustration. Somebody said if you had a steel ball the size of the earth and you came down with a feather and you just touched it and let go, touched it once every 10,000 years. By the time there's enough friction on that ball, the size of the the world, to wear it down to a marble, eternity would just be starting. That's a long time to be away from God and in hell, where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Let me give you a second warning that he gives us. Don't follow the wrong teachers. So let's get into that. If he's warning us not to follow the wrong teachers, here's what he says. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. He warns us, beware of these people. And doesn't that sound like a warning to you? Hey, you're going on in the world, but beware So he's giving you this warning. Jan gave me this picture that I thought describes what he's saying there. You have, uh, they'll come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravaging wolves. Here's the picture. And I thought, here's the wolf, you know, right under, got it there. And just so you can see, here's the zipper. (laughs) Because a wolf can come on. Now a wolf doesn't put it on. But Jesus is saying this. We have teachers in our world that are wrapped up. They want to smell like the sheep. They want to look like the sheep. They want to make the sheep think they're one of them. But what are they going to, what's the real purpose? They're going to lead people astray. And in our world, we have many false teachers who are saying, oh, all roads lead to the same place. They don't all lead to the same place. We don't even come and and try to make you believe that all roads lead to the same place. Jesus said he's the only way. No man can come to the Father except through him. 
So when I go back to the text, he said, you'll recognize those people. You'll recognize those false teachers. You'll recognize them by their what? By their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? And what's the answer? No. Or figs from thistles? No. He goes on. In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. Neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. So what's the issue here? It's about fruit. Now, you can, we can go into several aspects of this, but it may be just the fruit of the Spirit. But there's also the fruit of harvesting, you know, as you lead people to the Lord. You, you sow the seed and you harvest, and that's the result of good fruit. He goes on in verse 19. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. What did he say in chapter 7, verse 1? Judge not, lest you be judged. What's he doing here? He's not judging. And as a matter of fact, in that sense, the judging that goes on in Matthew 7, 1 is about um, what the motives are in a person's heart. I can't judge your motives. I don't know what your motives are. If somebody came to church, let's say they were in real estate, and I said, oh, I know why they came to church. They want to make contact with people. Or if they were selling insurance, oh, I know why they came to church. I don't know why a person comes to church. I can't judge their motives. But if they come and they're living in adultery, then God expects us to really share with them as a brother in Christ. You know, hey, this is not right. Why are you doing this? And that's why the Matthew 18 passage comes up when if, if somebody is sinning, go to him. And if he doesn't listen, take two or three witnesses. And if they don't listen, then tell it to the church. Because you're trying to win them back from their sin. So God says to test the spirits and try the spirits. But that's not judging their motives and their hearts. If they're living in open sin, what do you do? You confront open sin. Because you care enough about them to want to protect them. So in this passage, he says, you'll recognize them by their fruit. So later on, he goes into Matthew chapter 24, verse 11. He doesn't stop here at Matthew 7 with false prophets. In Matthew 24, 11, he says, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. So there'll be a lot of false prophets, and the, a lot of false prophets are going to deceive a lot of people. Many on both ends of the spectrum. Many false prophets, and many are going to be deceived. That means that there are people right here that can be deceived and that we need to be testing the spirits. We need to be trying to and say, what, what's the word say? What is this guy preaching? Is it, in, is it consistent with the word? By the time you get to Matthew 24, verse 24, it says this, false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. Did you hear that? They can even perform signs and wonders, but they're false messiahs and false prophets. Look, look at it again. False messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. The elect are those who have repented of their sins and trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. And they're trying to even deceive you. It doesn't end here, though. In Acts, he says that this way in Acts 20, 29, when Paul is leaving the church at Ephesus, he's giving a farewell speech to him, and here's what he says. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So again, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, what is he warning you about? False teachers. And what are they going to do? They're going to ravage through the flock. And who's the flock? The church the sheep. And they're going to try to sidetrack you. But this is when he's saying goodbye to the church at Ephesus. What does Peter say in, in 2 Peter chapter 2? These words. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly bring in destructive heresies. They're going to try to deny things in God's word. Heresies that are inconsistent with God's word. They will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. What does he mean they're going to deny the master? They're going to reach a place where they're going to say, ah, Jesus isn't God. 
or Jesus isn't the only way. You know, we have false religions in our world. We even have false Christian religions in our world. They, and what, we have things that we call cults. And there are groups that naturally, they don't want to be called a cult. Because they want to be, if they're called a cult, then it sets them out. And it's like saying to somebody, you're a false teacher. Well, who wants to listen to a false teacher? If everybody says, he's a false teacher, who's going to listen to him? And if everybody says, that's a cult, then who's going to follow him? But if they can be said to, wow, that's a Christian, that's a Christian group. So, how do, you, how do you ascertain a cult in our society? A couple of ways. One, they always, they usually add to the Word of God. I won't say always. They usually add to the Word of God. And so you've got groups that do that. The Mormons, with the Book of Mormons. Add, say, oh, this is just, you have the Bible and now you have the other book. Well, I don't need another book. I, you know, do I use Joel Osteen's book or do I use, who's the little book? No, I, I stay with the Word of God. He said, the Word of God will equip me. It's adequate for every good work. So usually they'll, they'll add to the Word of God or secondly, they'll deny Jesus is God. They'll make him less than God. He's God-like, but he's not God. And he surely then cannot be the savior of the world. You know, he, he's just a God and not the God. Jehovah's Witnesses will say that. And they'll take even John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And instead of the word was God, they'll say the word was a God. Making him less than God. So whether you have Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, that we, where would they be grouped? They would be grouped as a cult. And the reason is because they're adding to God's word or they're taking away Jesus as being the authority of God. So they come in, but there were, they were secretly, the last two lines, they were secretly, they will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. Now, if they're going to deny the master who bought them, they're going to say that Jesus isn't the only way to heaven, usually. You got to work your way to heaven, or you got to do this, or Jesus is a way to heaven. And the reason I believe that Peter, remember Peter was there on the Sermon on the Mount. Who was Jesus teaching? The disciples. So he was there. And he knew what Jesus was teaching. That there'll be a broad way and there'll be a narrow way. There'll be a broad way and there'll be a straight way. And so if I take this text and go all the way from 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, and follow through the context of it, when I get to verse 15 and 16, you'll see where Peter... He's going back to what Jesus taught him in the Sermon on the Mount. Because what does he say? They're going to deny. They're going to bring destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. So verse 15 says it this way. They have gone astray by abandoning what? The straight path. And where does he learn about the straight path? Louder. The Sermon on the, on the Mount. This way is broad. This way is narrow. This way is broad and leads to destruction. This way is narrow and leads to life. And so Peter's warning us. Let me warn you about a couple of people that are that way in our society. Okay? Let's start with Joel. And Joel Osteen is a pastor of 30,000 people in the Texas area. And he would say, well, this, his, his most recent book is Your Best Life Now. Someone has said, really, you're going to even write a book and say this is your best this is your best life? That kind of says, you know, I thought heaven was going to be the best I could get. You know, not in this life. This almost says your best life now because you're going to end up in hell. And so you, the best you get is right now. The best life is now. You're, you're headed for hell. But let me give you something else because Joel has been all over the map over the years. And probably rightly so because he has not been theologically trained by his own admission. And so when he gets in a position where he's difficult, where it's difficult, he'll say, well, you know, I really haven't had any theological training. I dropped out of college, he says. And so I, you know, so now you have this guy giving his opinions on things rather than going back to the word of God. What do we want to say to you? Look, God's word says there are false teachers. And they're false teachers who are clothed in what? Sheep's clothing. So they look like you, they smell a little bit like you, you think, wow, they're just like you, but they're totally different from you. Now, 
at one point, like I say, when he gets into trouble, he, he'll go back and say, you know, I really wasn't trained. And so he gets into that. When he was on Larry King Live, Larry King tried to pin him down uh, as to, is Jesus the only way to heaven? And on that program, and you can see this on YouTube, on that program, he'll say, you know, I, I just believe, he says, well, how about the Jewish people? Larry King says, how about the Jewish people? They don't know Jesus. Are they going to heaven? And he says, well, I just really hate to bash anybody like that. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, what did Jesus say? He's the only way. He said, well, if they don't have Jesus, are they going to hell? Well, I don't want to bash people like that. Well, it's not bashing people when you tell them the truth. Don't they want to know the truth? I want to know the truth. When my doctor said to me, I had a mass inside me, did I say, did he say to me, oh, you know, I don't want you to, you know, you're going to be upset with me if I tell you you got a mass. You know, you're going to have to go in and I'm going to have to cut you open and you probably aren't going to like that. You know, he cut me in order to help me. And when you tell people the truth, you're doing it so that they'll spend eternity in heaven. Now, to be honest with you, uh, once uh, Joel Osteen was on Larry King Live, uh, later on, uh, I'll give you the date here, July 1st, 2005, after he'd been on Larry King Live, he, uh, he then posted this online. Dear, dear friend, many of you have called, written, or e emailed regarding my recent appearance on Larry King Live. I appreciate your comments and value your words of correction and encouragement. Because people would say, while he was on the program, uh, one woman called in and said, I don't understand, I appreciate your books and this kind of stuff, but Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. Why aren't you willing to say that? about Jewish people or other people online. And so now he says, it was never my desire or intention to leave any doubt as to what I believe and whom I serve. I believe that in my heart, that, is the only, that it is only through Christ that we hope, have hope in eternal life. So, but at some points, some of these people come along and they get into problems because they either aren't trained or they don't know what they're saying at times. I'm glad he... he repented and said, hey, Jesus is the only way. I should have said that on Larry King Live. Let me give you some other thing, okay? Here's a, a part of his sermon, um, and he, he preaches again to 30,000 people. He has a, a former basketball stadium that they have converted into a, a worship area, and the, his sermon title is this, Program Your Mind for Victory. You know, I, it's not, I don't program my mind. I let God... God lives through me, and it is God who worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. If God be for us, who can be against us? Do I have to have, do I have to reprogram my mind somehow? Uh, so here's what he says in this. The first part of this, I'm going to give you two video clips. The first part, he's almost not too bad. He's talking about Abraham, and Abraham's 80 years old, and he doesn't have any children. And God has promised him he's going to have a son. Remember that? the son of promise, and Abraham didn't obey God. Instead, he had sexual relationships with a concubine and had another child, Ishmael, who wasn't the son of promise, wasn't with Sarah. So here's what Olstein says. This is what Abraham had to do. 20 years before he ever had a child, God said in Romans 4, 17, Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations. Notice, God said it in the past tense, I have made you, like it had already happened. His attitude was, God, if you say I'm a father, I'm not going to question it. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to try to figure it out. I'm just going to come into agreement with you. Now, what he said there sounds pretty good. The last part is where he's getting a little fuzzy. I'm just going to come in agreement with God. I, I want to speak the same words that God did and agree. You know, God, if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen, isn't it? Whether I agree with God or not. God said, when God spoke, what did he do? He said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. And he saw the light and said, that's good. And God did this, and it happened. God spoke this, and it happened. When God created the world, he made it out of nothing. He didn't, he didn't take some elements and say, oh, let's see, let's add a little bit of this and a little bit of this, and, and it happened. God spoke it, and he said, let there be light. 
And he separated the light from darkness. And he saw, here's day and night. And it was good. God spoke it into being. Okay? The second part of this, listen to what he says. Abraham is now 100 years old. He was 80. 20 years later, God's speaking to him. He has a son. 20 years later, at the age of 100, he had that child. Here's what I want you to see. Just because God said it didn't mean it was going to automatically come to pass. Did you hear what he just said? Just because God said it didn't mean it was going to happen? Let me put the quote on here. Just because God said it didn't mean it was going to automatically come to pass. If God says, I'm going to create the world, and he, cre- and he says, let there be light, there was light. If God says, and I give unto them eternal life, he gives them eternal life. If God says it's going to happen, is it going to happen? Yes. So why would somebody get up in front of thousands of people, seven million people a week, listen to this guy, and for him to get up there and say, just because God said it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Well, what other authority do you have other than God? So he says, beware of false teachers. Don't follow the wrong teachers. If you have somebody that says, oh, you, you know, don't, you, don't, you can't trust God. <laughs> Who else can you trust? If you can't trust God, can you trust anybody else? No. Let me go back to his book then. We, we would say, Joel is wrong on this, okay? But let me go back to his book, Your Best Life Now. If he thinks that God, you know, and I, and I know what I'm going to hear, you know, there are going to be some people say, well, I really like him. He really, you know, I'm not saying that we don't like him as a person. Hey, he, he can tell good stories maybe. The issue is, does he tell the truth about the word? If God says it, it's going to happen. God, somebody used to say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. It's that, you can be that confident. The word of the Lord stands sure. And so if somebody's denying that it stands sure, then we want to just hold it up. If a wolf comes by in sheep's clothing, what's the closest you can get to have sheep's clothing? To, deny, to, to quote the Bible and yet say, it's not sure whether it's going to happen. So what do we want to do? We want to warn you. In modern day senses, there are people out there that are saying to people everywhere that what God says might not be true. There may be more ways than one. There may, Jesus may not be the only way. But let me give you uh, even a more contemporary than than this guy. But let me even put here, though, um, if I were to really talk about this book, uh, let me be clear where I am. If I could take one letter out of this book title, I would make it look like this. Okay? Your best lie now. Because it's a lie. This isn't the best. The best is yet to come in eternity. And you want everybody, the Islamic people, the Jewish people, everybody to know Jesus. He, he said himself, no man comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is the one that said, this is exclusive. This isn't one of many ways. This is the way. But let me give you a more contemporary one in that. Rob Bell. Raise your hand if you know Rob Bell. Okay. So a pocket of people. The Rob Bell, uh, in, in uh, 1999, he started what is known as Mars Hill Bible Church in Wyoming, Michigan. Uh, please, n- not to be confused with some other Mars Hill churches, uh, So just so you know that. He actually went back. He grew up, uh, he was in California. He and his wife went back to Michigan where he served under a pastor there. He served for a short time. He was doing the Saturday night services, and then he decided to start a church. They started it in Wyoming, Michigan in, in 1999. In 2000, just one year later, he started in February of 1999. In, in July of 2000, he was given a mall to have for his church. You know, I'd love, you know, I'd... I'd <laughs> I'd love to have more space like that, you know, and to, you know, to have all those kind of things. But, you know, I, I'd rather have this 
and be right on target with the Lord than to be somewhere else on that. So here's what happens. In uh, 2011, the attendance was 8,000 to 10,000 people coming to his church. In 2011, he wrote the book that is on the screen. Rob Bell, author, he's authored a couple of books at that point. He was the author of Velvet Elvis. Okay? And then the second, this one is a book about heaven, hell, and the fate of every person who ever lived. And the title of the book is Love Wins. In the book, really what he's trying to say is, look, God said that who can separate us from the love of Christ? And God so loved the world. And so God is not willing that any should perish. So God is not going to let anybody go to hell. They don't have to trust him because love wins and God is love. So love always wins. So you don't even have to worry about anybody. And as a result of that, well, this was... uh, Early in 2011, in September of 2011, he resigned from his church there. And let me be clear on this. There are inconsistencies all over the internet on on his part and others as, as to why he resigned. He's still the pastor emeritus of that church. He's still a guest speaker at his, at that church from time to time. But there are those in his church that really were upset about the book because the book goes against what the Word of God teaches. But as a result of that book, Time Magazine came out with this cover. What if there's no hell? And the whole purpose of this article was to answer Rob Bell's issue on his book on Love Wins. God's Word clearly teaches that if a person doesn't repent of their sins and doesn't trust Christ as Savior and Lord, they'll spend eternity in hell. Either God lied in the Bible or Rob's book is contrary to what God really says. God God says, unless you repent of your sins and trust Christ, if you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God hath raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. But Rob is saying, no, you don't necessarily have to do that. So he left his church in September 2011 some say because of this book and spawned the crisis. Some say not. I don't know. I want to give you some, some statements that are made about him in this regard. Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, caused a major controversy within the evangelical community. The controversy was, was the subject of a Time magazine cover story and a feature article in the New York Times. In the book, Bell states that it's been clearly communicated to many that this belief, what belief? In hell as conscious eternal torment is a central truth of the Christian faith. And to reject it is in essence to reject Jesus. Here's what Bell says. This is misguided and toxic and ultimately subverts the contagious spread of Jesus' message of love, peace, forgiveness, and joy that our world desperately needs to hear. You know something? Jesus' message of love and joy and peace and all those things comes after you realize, wow, I need to make a decision. There's a broad way, there's a narrow way. And what this guy is saying is, oh, no, there's no, you know, hell is not really, no, no. Everybody's going to make it because love wins. He's 43 today. He's moved back to California. But let me give you some other statements about this. The book was criticized by numerous conservative evangelical figures, such as Al Mohler, who was the president of a seminary in Kentucky, John Piper, and David Platt, with Mohler saying that the book was theologically disastrous for not rejecting universalism. You know what universalism is? that everybody's going to make it to heaven. No matter what way you're following, everybody's going to make it to heaven. That's why you have the universalism, universalist church in America. They believe that, you know, everybody can make it. Everybody's going to make it. You don't have to really, you know, one can trust Jesus and one can trust something else. Goes on. Bell also, in the book, Bell also questioned evacuation theology. You know what he's talking about there? The rapture. <laughs> evacuation <laughs> theology. <laughs> 
You know, it seems like they have to come up with a new term every so many years because, you know, you you got to be creative in that way. Bell also questioned evacuation theology, which has Christians focused on getting to heaven instead of focusing on God's renewal and transformation of this world. You know, God's really not interested so much in, in transforming roses without thorns. That's going to happen. When Jesus comes back, God's word says, all creation groans, earnestly desiring the return of the Lord. Because there wouldn't have been any thorns if sin had it in the world. There wouldn't be any de- death if sin had it into the world. The Lord's wanting to transform people. And people, as they live their lives, it, the world gets somewhat transformed. But his focus is getting people to heaven. And he's saying here, basically Christians are focusing on going to heaven. Well, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And wherever that is, is heaven. And I want to be there with him in heaven. Let me give you one last thing about this as well. Once he resigned from his church, he moved to California. He spoke in the Viper Room in L.A. At his Viper Room appearance in July 2012, Bell took a question from an audience member concerned about the church's acceptance of gay members. Said Bell, some people are gay, and you're our brothers, and you're our sisters, and we love you. We love you. Gay people are passionate disciples of Jesus, just like I'm trying to be. So let's all get together and try to do something about the truly big problems in our world. You know, I thought, I thought the big problem was that people are going to hell. And if they're going to be there for all eternity, there's no problem bigger than getting people to trust Christ, to get them to heaven. He goes on, on March 17, 2013, in an interview at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, Bell said... I am for marriage. I am for fidelity. I am for love. Whether it's a man with a woman, a man and a woman, a woman and a woman, a man and a man. I think the ship has sailed. This is the world we are living in, and we need to affirm people wherever they are. You know, we need to confront sin wherever it is. We can love people and hate their sin. That's exactly, you know, Jesus reached out, but when the Pharisees were in sin, did he say, oh, I'm just going to accept you where you are. He said, you whited sepulchers, you know, and turned over the tables and went after them because there was sin. So I've given you a couple of examples, but did you notice the absent of the Bible's authority in his statements? Look at the last four lines. I am for marriage. I am for fidelity. I am for love. And then, okay, give me the scripture. It's God's word that ought to be the authority. Not my opinions, not Rob's opinions. Keep coming back. There are false teachers, and they dress themselves. They look like they're the real thing. They look like they're the real deal. But people are going to hell because if they don't teach them the truth. The truth is there's one way to heaven. There's one God existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that Son wants to come and save you, be your Savior. And he wants to put the Holy Spirit to live in your life so you live like you should. And anybody that teaches there's another way to heaven is a false religion, is a false prophet. And God is warning you about that. So that's why more people are going to hell than to heaven, because there are people that aren't teaching the truth. There are people that are teaching you that You don't have to trust Christ. Everybody's going to go to heaven because love wins. What are the four warnings? One, don't go the wrong way. Two, don't follow the wrong teachers. Three, don't yield to the wrong will. Here it is. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Boy, if you're sitting, as you're sitting here today, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, or if you have just prayed some, 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 some little prayer that, you know, you, you thought, okay, uh, I don't want to go to hell. Fire insurance, okay, I'm going to ask Jesus, what do I have to pray? Oh, okay, yeah, Jesus, come into my life. Okay, where do I sign? Okay. And that's why he says here, not everyone who says to me what? Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. okay. The will of the Father, the will of the Father. But most people, their emphasis on this text goes back to one word. 
let me put it here like this. Who does something, does the will of the Father, does. If we're not cautious on this verse, if misinterpreted, this verse could lead us to think we can work for our salvation. Paul writes it this way, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, not work for your salvation with fear and trembling. Do you understand the difference? I'm going to work it out in my life, but I don't work to get saved. I work because I'm saved. I ought to serve God. I ought to do things for God. I ought to help other people. Why? Because I'm saved. And he tells me to help the widows and the orphans. Why? Because he tells me to help these people. Not because, oh, maybe I'll work my way to heaven. So let's go here. And I want to say there are two kinds of religions in the world. Because he's saying, every, anyone who does the will of the Father, but I'm going to divide it into two groups now. Okay? Every religion in the world, I'm going to divide it into just two groups. There's a religion that says you need to do things to get to heaven. And they make the list. And, and if we were to fill out the list... Do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this, do this, and don't do this, and don't do this, and don't do this. And every, in the 90, well, however many religions of the world, there's only one religion that doesn't practice this way. And that's Christianity. Now, it doesn't say you don't do anything, but you don't do anything to get saved. You do things because you're saved. But you don't do things to get saved. That's why God's word is so clear. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. That's why in Romans 4, the word of God is saying, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Did you hear that? To him that worketh what? Not. It's not something you do to earn heaven. So, every religion <clears throat> in that do category. Christianity, let me put it over here on the right-hand side. And I want to say, true Christianity. Because I've already shown you Rob Bell's view as someone claiming to be a Christian. I've already talked about Mormons who claim to be Christians. I've already talked about Jehovah's Witnesses who claim to be Christians. Why do you think they're doing all that door-to-door -door stuff? They're working their way. They're going to do it. But when it comes to true Christianity, I'm going to put it this way because I want you to see how close it is to the other religions. If I'm going to pass off a counterfeit $20 bill, I'm only going to pass it off if it looks close to the real thing. If I give you a $20 Monopoly bill and say, hey, get down, get down to Target and get something, you know, all right, get down to McDonald's and buy lunch. And you hand them the Monopoly $20 bill, what are they going to do? They're going to look at you and say, do, 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 do. Yes, yeah, can I have the guys in the white coat? Yes, I'm over here and I got a guy giving me Monopoly money. Or if I said, how about, how about our Awana money, our Awana bucks? The only place that works is here at our Awana store, the printers of the money. But otherwise, it doesn't look like the real deal. You, if you're going to pass off a counterfeit, you are going to come as close to the real deal as you can. The same is true with Christianity. If they're going to try to pass themselves off as being a Christian in their, their focus, they're going to look as close as possible to the real deal. So look at the difference between those who want you to do everything and true Christianity. What does true Christianity say on the right? It is done for you. And where did it get done? On the cross. And what did Christ cry out from the cross? It is finished. It's done. Everything for the payment of sin has been done. Once and for all. He doesn't go back like the Old Testament priest on a daily basis, even offering sacrifices for their own sin. He had no sin. And now he dies for your sin and mine, once for all. 
Does that mean that you won't work once you're saved? No. You ought to work because faith without works is what? Dead. But you don't work to get saved. You work because you're saved. I didn't work to, to win my wife. I loved her. And your love draws someone to you. But once I got married, my love went to work. And your love better go to work too or your marriage isn't going to last long. Because they're going to say, you say you love me, but you sure don't show me. And the Lord is giving us an opportunity to show him not to get saved, but because we're saved. If I go back here, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? I emphasize the, f the fact of the do there. Because what are they? I did this, and I did this, and I did this. And some here are going to say, well, Lord, didn't, didn't, I, didn't I hand out tracts at the Almond Blossom Festival? Didn't I go to the Holland Garden Show? Didn't I help in the Iwana program? Didn't I help in the, the House of Hope? Didn't I go to the, the schools to do the Good News Club? Lord, I did all those things. Do you understand? On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Do you understand that people could even do miracles in the name of the Lord? And what does he say to them? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. What did we sing in the early part of the service? We sang the song, Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, you are the greatest thing, you're the best, you're my all, you're the best, you're my joy, my righteousness. Why? Because I know him. And to know him is life eternal. Not to know him. You know, I, I know... Uh, I've known uh, uh, about the presidents for most of, most of my life, the different presidents. I, I can go back and start with Eisenhower and go on from there. I can't go back deeper. You know, I, I, I was actually born sooner than that, but I didn't know the president. But I knew about those presidents. But they didn't know me, and I didn't know them. I knew about them. And some of you may know about God, but he doesn't know you, and you don't know him. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. That's the issue. He's warning you about this. And he's saying, don't go here. So who does the will of the Father? He says, those who do the will of the Father, they're going to make it to heaven. Let me give you John 6, 40. And you'll see it clearly. For this is the will of my Father. So we know this is going to be the will of the Father. That everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. What do I do to do the will of the Father? I see with the eyes of faith and I believe that he died for my sins, he was buried, he rose again so that he could be the Lord of my life and save me from my sin. Let me give you one more. There are four warnings. He said, don't go the wrong way. He said, don't follow the wrong teachers. He said, don't yield to the wrong will. And don't build on the wrong foundation. Now, you, this is like water off a duck's back if you're not careful, because you know this section. You've sung it as a little kid, maybe. You know, the wise man built his house upon the, th on the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house on the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And you know the rest. Here's the text. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, please note, and acts on them, will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the wind blew and pounded that house, yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. 
Got it? The foundation's on the rock. What's the rock? We know what the rock is because 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4 tells us, even goes back to Moses. And here's what it says. Now I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Verse 3, they all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So if you're building on anything other than Christ, your life, your family, your marriage can collapse and will collapse in the end because it's going for destruction. Go back to the text. Here's what he says. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the wind blew and pounded that house and it collapsed and its collapse was great. Your collapse will be great if you haven't built your life on Christ. He finishes the Sermon on the Mount with this way in verse 28. When Jesus had finished this sermon, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like their scribes. You know, when you come to church, I don't think you walk away saying, hmm, I wonder what Pastor Madison thought about Joel Olstein's teaching. I wonder if Pastor was for Rob Bell or against what he's teaching there. We want to teach you from the authority of the word and teach you, this is what God's word says. We have no authority to, in that sense. The word is the authority. And when the word contradicts where people are preaching and teaching, then that's where we want to go. And we want you to know it so that you can make it to heaven because the issue is more people are going to go to hell than heaven. And I'm just giving you the warnings that Jesus gave. Don't go the wrong way. Don't follow the wrong teacher. Don't yield to the wrong will. Don't build on the wrong foundation. And the question I have for you is, have you acted upon his warnings? He's warned you don't go the wrong way. He's warned you all these things. But he that has my words and acts on them be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. So for your life today, I hope you don't face the Lord in eternity and hear him say, you know, depart from me. I never knew you. Obviously, he knows about you. But he wants to know you in the same sense where you trust him. He's your Savior. But unless you do that, hell is your destination. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Father in heaven, this is perhaps the most important time. Someone's eternal destiny teetering in the balance. Would you speak to hearts right now? Would you challenge them with your Holy Spirit how to trust you, how to make you the Lord and Savior? While your heads are bowed, while your eyes are closed, if you've been one of the people today that are uncertain of your eternal destiny, can you pin that down today? Can you confess to him you're a sinner? Can you thank him for dying on the cross for your sin? Being buried? Coming back to life? Can you ask him today to come and live in your life? To be your savior? Will you tell him you want him to be your Savior and Lord? You want to live in obedience to him? Father, you've heard the prayers of some of the people here. 
in terms of the salvation prayer they just made. Reach their hearts now and save them for your glory and their eternal well-being. In Jesus' name.